Welcome to part two of the Transplant Medication Educational DVD. This part will cover transplant medications and will focus on the medications we will use to keep your new organ healthy. This class of medications is referred to as anti-rejection medications. The remaining two parts, including the anti-infective medications and supplements, will be reviewed in detail in parts three and four of the transplant medication educational video. To make things simple, I like to categorize your medicine into two different groups. In group one, there is the medicine to keep your new organ healthy. These are your anti-rejection medications because they are keeping your new organ from rejecting or failing. In group two is your medicine to keep you healthy by preventing you from getting sick. These are your anti-infective medications and also your supplements. So the typical home routine has between two and three anti-rejection medications, which are one, tacrolimus, two, mycophenolate, and three, prednisone, which you may or may not need. All two or three medications work together to keep your organ healthy and functioning for you. The three typical anti-infective medications are an antibiotic, which prevents bacterial infections, an antiviral, which prevents viral infections, and an antifungal, which prevents fungal infections. These anti-infective medications, along with some supplements, will prevent you from getting sick. Who should know about my medicine? The answer is all healthcare providers. Your dentist, your doctor, your transplant coordinator, and your pharmacist should all know. In fact, your pharmacist checks for drug-drug interactions at every refill of your medicine. And so this is a key person to keep an updated medication list to. And as I said before, please notify your transplant coordinator or pharmacist before making any medication changes. Now let's discuss your anti-rejection medication. Let me try to explain why these medications are absolutely critical for you to take. Have you ever had a cold before? I know that I have. When you have a cold, there is a foreign virus in your body that is making you feel sick. Now, after about four to five days, your cold typically goes away because your body actually kills that virus. Your body knows that this virus is something foreign that should not be there because it's not you. And the immune system actually destroys this virus. After a transplant, it's kind of the same idea. Your body thinks of your new organ as something that is foreign and should not be there because it's not you. And as a result of this first response, the first response of your body is to attack that new organ. When your body attacks that new organ, what, is, what happens is called rejection. To keep this from happening, we give you anti-rejection medications that work by lowering your immune system. And by doing that, we can greatly lower your risk of having your organ being attacked by your immune system. The medications and doses you receive after transplant of your anti-rejection medications will depend a lot on different factors, including the type of new organ you received and your past medical history. You will all receive individual counseling on your specific medication regimen during your hospitalization for the transplant and also after in transplant clinic. Let's review each anti-rejection medication separately. We will begin with tacrolimus. But before we get into the nitty gritty of each medication, I want to make one very important comment about the anti-rejection medications. You should never stop or change the dose of these medications unless directed to do so by your transplant coordinator. If you change or stop any of these medications without us knowing, this could put you at risk for rejection. On the side of this slide, I also want to point out a quick tip about the names of these medications because this can be a big source of confusion. Each medication has two names, the brand name and the generic name. We will be using the generic name or the names that are not in parentheses for the remainder of the presentation. Now on to tacrolimus. Tacrolimus is available in three different strengths, 0.5 milligrams, one milligram, and five milligrams. 
you will be sent home with two or three dose strengths so that you can make your dose at home with ease. Tacrolimus is taken twice a day or about 12 hours apart. This is a medication that will require lab draws. These lab or blood draws help us to know if your tacrolimus is dosed correctly and if you have too much or too little in your body. Your blood is drawn more often right after transplant, but over time that frequency will decrease. What you need to know is that the tacrolimus lab draws are usually scheduled on Mondays and Thursdays and that you should not take your morning tacrolimus until after your blood is drawn. You can take all of your other medications before your lab draw except for tacrolimus. Let me give you an example. Let's say that you usually take your tacrolimus at 8 a.m., but tomorrow you have your tacrolimus lab draw scheduled at 9. When you wake up tomorrow for your lab draw, you can take all your morning medicine at 8 a.m. except for tacrolimus, which you will take with you to your labs and then take exactly right after you get your blood drawn. Your transplant coordinator will call you either the evening of your lab draw or the next day with a new dose. If you do not hear from your transplant coordinator, assume no news is good news and continue with your previous dose. One thing to note as well is that the frequency of blood draws will decrease, like I said before, as you get further out from your transplant. Some common side effects of tacrolimus are tremors, headache, hair loss, diarrhea, and sometimes kidney injury. Now with that said, just because I mentioned these side effects, it does not mean that you will have them. These are just some general side effects seen in some people on this medicine. Tacrolimus can be taken either with or without food, but the key is to take it in the same way each time. Food does affect how well this medication gets absorbed into your system. It does not matter what type of food you eat or how much you eat though. There is one fruit and juice that you need to avoid as a transplant patient. This is grapefruit and grapefruit juice, but any other juice is perfectly fine. Many over-the-counter medications interact with tacrolimus as well. So please always check with your transplant coordinator or transplant pharmacist before starting a new medication. Mycophenolate is the next medicine we will discuss. There are two brand names for mycophenolate, Myfortic and Celsept. Mycophenolate mofetil or Celsept is available in two different strengths, 500 milligrams and 250. Mycophenolate sodium or myfortic is available in two different strengths as well, 180 milligrams and 360 milligrams. You will likely be discharged taking the mycophenolate mofetil or Celsept version. Like tacrolimus, this medication is taken twice a day, about 12 hours apart. You may take tacrolimus and mycophenolate together in the morning and in the evening. Some people develop upset stomach to mycophenolate and need to take the medication more times throughout the day to avoid this upset stomach. The most common side effect to mycophenolate, like I mentioned, is upset stomach, including diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, and heartburn. And this often goes away within the first few weeks after taking your medicine, but we have seen it later on as well. However, if you are having four to six loose bowel movements per day at home, please call your transplant coordinator. We need to know that you're, diar that you're having diarrhea because it can affect how the medications get absorbed in your system, and it can also lead to dehydration. To further reduce stomach upset, we recommend taking mycophenolate with food. Your white blood cell count can also be reduced while taking my mycophenolate. So you will have your white blood cell count drawn with your labs. Remember those drug-drug interactions that I mentioned before with tacrolimus? With mycophenolate, you should avoid antacids like Tums, magnesium, aluminum, and calcium. If you need to take an antacid or these one of these supplements, please separate them from your anti-rejection medications by at least two to four hours. Specifically under special instructions, 
it is important for you to never crush or break mycophenolate tablets. Also, mycophenolate can cause great harm to an unborn baby. And so women who are pregnant or planning on becoming pregnant should not handle mycophenolate. All females of childbearing age taking mycophenolate must use two forms of birth control. If you are of childbearing age, either the transplant pharmacist or doctor will review your contraception options with you. Prednisone is the last anti-reduction medication we will discuss. Not every patient will be discharged on prednisone. And if you need prednisone, this will be discussed with you at the time of transplant. Patients who receive a kidney and or a pancreas transplant may need to take prednisone depending on their risk of rejection at the time of transplant. This will be determined by your transplant doctor and pharmacist. Patients who have a liver transplant will take prednisone for a total of two months after transplant, but some patients require prednisone for a longer period of time. Prednisone is typically taken once a day and is best taken in the morning with breakfast. Prednisone can upset your stomach, so it's best to take it with a meal. One common side effect of prednisone is hyperactivity, which some people describe as jitteriness. It's almost like taking five to six cups of coffee all at once. Because of this, we try not to dose prednisone close to bedtime so that you're not kept up all night. Another common side effect of prednisone is upset stomach or acid reflux. Prednisone can be hard on your stomach and because of this, prednisone should be taken with food. We will also give you a medication at discharge to further reduce your risk of that acid reflux or heartburn type symptoms. Prednisone can also cause elevations in your blood sugars and some patients actually need to be on insulin to control their blood sugars after transplant. Finally, under special instructions, if you have high blood sugar or diabetes before transplant, you will likely need insulin or higher doses of your insulin after. Like I've previously stated, prednisone should be taken in the morning. This will also hopefully help to prevent difficulty sleeping or insomnia at night. We also recommend that you have a yearly eye exam while on prednisone, as prednisone can increase your risk of developing cataracts. The good news with prednisone is that we lower the dose the further you get out from transplant. So many of these side effects you may notice will likely go away as your dose is lowered. We have gone over all of the most common anti-rejection medications. The medications listed here are what we label as alternatives. They include cyclosporin, which is an alternative to tacrolimus, Azathioprine, which is an alternative to mycophenolate, serolimus, which is an alternative to mycophenolate or tacrolimus, everolimus, which is an alter alternative to mycophenolate or tacrolimus, and belatacept, which is an alternative to tacrolimus. We will not review these medications in detail because you would only take these medications if you were not taking the most common anti-rejection medications, which are tacrolimus, mycophenolate, or prednisone. In summary, you are taking two or three medications to prevent rejection. Separate antacids and certain supplements from your anti-rejection medications by at least two to four hours. Do not crush or cut mycophenolate tablets and always make sure to take the anti-rejection medications as directed by your transplant doctor.